So we need to build a strong foundation. And what does it look like to build a strong foundation? Well, number one, we need to look forward and move forward and don't look back. Because every time you look back, what happens? You're going to get caught into guilt or shame or what happened yesterday. We might want to relive all the good things of yesterday, but we have to move forward. You can't stay stuck there. You need to surround yourself with a solid Christian community to build your foundation. It's important to have friends all around, but you really need to build a solid foundation of a Christian community. You need to find an accountability partner, a mentor who can speak into your life, who can turn around where you can share with them and they can share with you and you can begin to mentor one another and to be able to speak truth into one another's life so that if you start walking off of the, the path of righteousness, if you stop, if you start getting on that path and you go a little bit off, they're going to go, come on, let's get back right onto that path. That you would hear that from that person. We need to create a new routine in our life, not one that was of, of the world and of the past, but where we can spend time with God in word and in prayer. You need to find that. And we need to serve and share. Those are five areas that will help build a strong foundation. Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, it says, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. And last week I talked about how God spent and is still spending time yearning for a relationship with you. And he, he created, he established, he prepared and is preparing a place to have a relationship with you constantly in that process and yearning. And he's jealous for us. But in order for us to have vision to build a strong foundation, that song says, you got to have a dream, you have to have a vision, it takes a little time to believe. That was the crux of that song. you got to have a dream, you have to have a vision, it takes a little time to believe. It's a place of growing and building. It just doesn't all of a sudden, you don't have this foundation, I have this dream, I have this vision, and boom, it's there. Now, we want that kind of fast food. We want it just established and built and, and created right then and there. The moment that we think about it, we want it done. But it takes a lot of work and it takes people working together. And in order for us to build a strong foundation, shouldn't we be focusing on Securing our eternity while here on earth. Because we're talking about our foundation in him. And we need to be focusing on securing our foundation on here on earth. Because once we're dead, it's too late. It is. It's just too late. You have made your decision here on earth. And in 2 Peter 1.10... It's talking about making our election sure. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Now, I was, as I was processing through building a foundation, this verse kept on going through my mind over and over and over again. What does it mean to confirm our calling and our election? What does that mean? For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the internal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what are the qualities that we need to practice? And we're going to get to that in a few minutes. What is it to confirm our election and our calling? So that tells me right there, there's something more than just saying the prayer of salvation in our life. 
That, it, that scripture right there tells me we need to do more than saying, God, would you just come into my life and then go on our merry way and do whatever we want to do. We need to build a foundation. And that's what he's talking about here. Because in Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That just goes right back up there. If we practice these qualities, we will not, we will never fall. And they tie in. Scripture confirms itself. And so when we're building this foundation, we need to understand Though we chose God and we said the prayer of salvation, we didn't really choose him. He chose us before the foundations of the world. And in scripture, it says, Ephesians 1, 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So his word confirms us. He called us. That's, that's like he, he, he's calling you. He's like going, Roy, Roy, Trina, Pastor Dina, Pastor Clarissa. He just keeps on calling us and wooing us. And, you know, we think we get this foundation dug and we get it built. And, it's, and here we are doing all this work. But... How many of us know that when you have a house, there is always work to be done in the house? It, it just is a never-ending process. That there is always something that needs to be done in your house. What makes it any different in our salvation with the Lord? It just doesn't stop when we say a prayer or when we come to the church. There is this place where we have to keep on working and keep on working and keep on working. Now, we're not saved by our works, but our fruit of our works shows our salvation. So a saying a prayer of salvation by the scripture that we just read. I'll go back and read it. Ephesians 1, 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So us saying the prayer of salvation was not an arbitrary or whimsical decision. But it was something God had planned. He had planned it before the foundations of the world. He had called your name before the foundations of the world. That's powerful. That's something to get excited about because God called you. He has chosen you and he has called you. It's not arbitrary. It's not whimsical. He called you. Wow. That puts a perspective in my mind. Like It just blows my mind to think out of all the people in the world, he said, Catherine, I'm calling you to be mine. I'm calling you before the foundations of this world is established that you are my daughter. And we should not take God's grace and salvation for granted. But we need to grow and build our personal foundation in him. It is so important. So what does that look like? I'm going to ask that question over and over again. What does it mean to confirm our our election. What does that mean? Matthew 7, 24. There's two foundations. Now, when you were building your house of cards, it was really difficult to keep your house standing, wasn't it? It was really hard. Now, I saw some progress. Look at Jonathan's over here on Zoom. I wish you could see this. His house is still standing, but he is way away from his table. He's not breathing on it. He's not leaning against his table. He's like, here's my house. <laughs> Everybody blow that direction. And I huffed and I puffed and I blew the house down, right? <laughs> so the power of worship. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What are we building our foundation on? We can't build it like we build a house of cards, right? There is no strength in that. It just takes a, just a little, I mean, if we just nudge Jonathan's table, those cards would just fall down, unless he cheated and put glue on it, or tape, or gum, gum, yeah, there you go. But do you under, you know, we have two foundations that we build on. We've built it on the Word of God, or we build it on the world. That's what our foundations are built on. And depending on what we build on is how we're going to stand. And when the storm comes and the winds blow, what? where are we standing? Are we going to bend like a reed and our roots are going to be deep, really deep in him so that we don't get uprooted and pulled away and blown away? Or are we going to be in that place, our foundation? Is it going to be in a place where it's where it just blows? Like, the wind's taking me here, and the wind's taking me here, and I don't know where I'm at, and pretty soon we just get all turned around and we're off of our path. But we build our foundation on Him. We need to be responsible for building our own foundation. We can come to church, and we're digging on Sunday, or we're digging in the women's ministry or the men's ministry or our podcasts. But are we being responsible for our own foundation and really putting the roots down and all the things that are necessary to build? Do we have a blueprint? Do we have a vision? God, I'll, I'll, I'll confess my sin. There was a while back where God says, he, he just said to me, he goes, what do you want, Catherine? And I gave the good religious answer. God, I just want whatever you want for me. He goes, where's your vision? Where's your vision? He goes, I want to bless your vision because I called you uniquely to be who you are, and I've created a vision within you. It's not... God, I want to be whatever you want me to be. Oh, the wind's blowing over here, so I'm going to do this. Oh, the wind's blowing over here, so I'm going to be here. Where's my roots? My roots are not in what he's called me to be and the vision that he created for me. Where's your vision? We need to be responsible and we need to be diligent to confirm our election and our calling in him. Every one of us, just as we saw a different picture, a different scene in that picture that depicts a little bit of who we are. Because we're going to see things differently. So if we're looking down at the foundation of the church at large, take a deep breath because this might hurt a little. Okay? Looking at the foundation of the church at large, a foolish church would accept the cultural whims even when they're contradictory to the scripture and justify it as being an accepting and loving church. When in fact a wise church would accept and love the person and despise the sinful cultural whims that contradict scripture. When I was talking, when I was studying about this and studying about building, and we're going to continue the series on this, we have a few more services. And he spoke this to me, and this is why the Americas, this is what is happening. And this is why we're in the position we're in. 
because the church has been whimsical to the cultural whims of what's going on and accept it contradictory to scripture. And we need to be a people and we need to get strength and we need to dig our foundation in the truth of the word of God and we need to stand regardless of what the nation says or what they do in this world because we believe in the word and not the world. If we are a foolish man, it's like building a house with a deck of cards. It's just going to tumble and fall. So I want to take quick inventory on what a foolish man looks like. Proverbs 10.8. A foolish man is, an, is a constant talker, boasts about himself, and chooses not to listen. A foolish man in Proverbs 10.14 and Proverbs 12.15 says, A foolish man doesn't care about learning, and they know it all. Have you ever met a know-it-all? Okay. Don't walk up to him and go, you fool. Okay? Don't do that. Yeah, okay? Just pray for him. Okay? <laughs> Proverbs 10, 18. A foolish man speaks poorly about others and chooses to put others down so he looks good. Proverbs 10, 23. A foolish man does not take sin or its consequences seriously. Ah, I can do what I want. God's going to forgive me, full of grace. Says so in the Bible, he's full of grace and love, but doesn't take the consequences of their sin seriously. We all sin, okay? We all sin. But there's a difference between sinning and then outrightly being powerful of your sin. And just keep on doing it. Proverbs 13, 16. A foolish man boasts of things he does wrong. Have you ever heard someone, oh, I got away with that. It was so awesome. I did this and got away with it. Oh, that was so cool. Proverbs 14, 16. A foolish man is reckless and careless. He doesn't take into account how his decisions will affect him later or how they affect others. Oh, how many times have we just gone out and made decisions and it has caused harm to you or caused harm to others? I have. Proverbs fifteen fifteen: a foolish man does not obey his parents, nor his spiritual parents, and despise father's instructions. And so if you cannot take instruction from your natural father, how can you take instruction from your heavenly father? Proverbs 26, 11, a foolish man repeats his mistakes rather than learning from them. How many times do we fall and have to hit our fa plant, face plant? Oh, oh, I did it again. Oh, you know, we have to learn pretty soon. That bruise on our nose gets pretty painful every time you hit it, right? Psalms 53.1, a foolish man is wicked in all his ways and denies God. That's what a foolish man looks like. That's when our house is built and the winds blow and crumbles it down. So I'm going to sum this up real quick on the foolish man. We can say that it's all about themselves, isn't it? A foolish man doesn't listen. They talk about other people. They think they're better than others. They are proud and arrogant. They take advantage of God's grace and dis disregards what is sinful. They are a God unto themselves. That's a foolish man. But let's take inventory of a wise man. I know some of those areas we have to say ouch in, huh? We're a work in progress. We need to redig that foundation and go, okay, God, I'm digging that part out and I'm going to have to fix it up just like we have to fix our houses. They're not going to be perfect, you guys. 
our house is not going to be perfect. It is impossible to be perfect. Only God is perfect. So there's no condemnation, correct? But we want to take inventory of what a wise man looks like, and this is what a wise man looks like. Proverbs 29, 11. A wise man holds back his tongue. Boy, am I practicing that right now when it comes to political stuff. <laughs> I could just be, I could walk, I could go home and I could just like, and I'm learning. I'm learning to be a wise man, okay? Not perfect at it. You can ask my, uh, my mother. Proverbs 1.5. No, don't ask her, okay? She'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Proverbs 1.5. A wise man listens and is teachable. Have you, a wise man is a person who can receive correction. That they submit under authority. That they turn around, they're teachable. They have teachable spirits. Oh, Lord, would you give us a teachable spirit? And, Lord, would you hold our tongue when we are not correctly speaking? Proverbs 21, 20, a wise man prepares his house for what is needed. They come in and they prepare. They're just not, they, it's not whimsical. They're just not going out wasting and, and just turning around and not having things prepared. But if you had a storm coming that you knew it was going to do damage to your house, wouldn't you prepare your house for that? A wise man prepares. We need to prepare our house, our spiritual house, so when that storm comes, that we're prepared and we can stand on the word of God. Lord, by your stripes we are healed. By the blood of Jesus we're cleansed. And we can just turn around and we can stand and build our house on his word. Matthew 5, 5 and Proverbs eleven two. A wise man has a humble spirit. You know what? Yeah, you're right. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I'm going to confess my sins. I'm going to share with you that I'm not a perfect person. But we already knew that. Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man turns away from evil. Instead of succumbing to those things that are temptations before you, whatever they may be, you're going to turn away from it. Word says that we submit ourselves to God, rebuke the enemy, and he must flee. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He must flee. Proverbs 22, 6. A wise man will train their children in godly ways. And I know we have a lot of children out there who have been trained in godly ways that have chosen their own way. But I'm standing on the word, God, would you bring them back into the kingdom? Would you just bring them back in? Take them, Lord, Father. Convict their hearts. Convict them by the blood of Jesus Christ. They're your children from the beginning and the foundations of time. You've called them, and we call them back into the kingdom of God. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. A wise man makes best use of their time and their speech is gracious. Ouch. Yeah, for sure, Tony, we're working on it. Ba makes best use of our time. Man, time, how many, how many knows that time just goes like this? I mean, it just flies by. One minute you, I mean, you get out of bed, and the next minute you're crawling back into bed. It goes by so fast. But let's be our timekeeper. I'm going to make a challenge that we would keep track of our time. How much of it is it that we're not using it wisely? Proverbs 10, 8, a wise man is obedient. Well, that's one thing when you have kids and it's like, yeah, they have to be obedient to us, but we need to be obedient to him. We're accountable to God. Proverbs 14, 29 says a wise man is slow to anger. What was that, Tony? <laughs> Walk it off. That's right. Walk it off. Slow to anger. How, do, how are we diligent 
to confirm our calling and election. Let's be the wise man. Let's be the wise man. Let's stay away from the foolish things and let's be a wise man. I'm going to finish on 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10. I started on verse 10, but this is how we are diligent to confirm our calling and our election. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement our faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Or if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he has cleansed from, our, from his former sins. Lord, don't let us forget what you've done in our life. What you saved us from. Don't let us forget. Therefore, brothers, be all more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. A guaranteed door open for us into eternity. So what is that? Practicing our strong foundation taking 2 Peter 1, 5, and I'm just going to sum it up with this. Having good moral standards, that's what virtue is. Being filled with the knowledge of God. Practicing self-control. Standing steadfast in the truth of the gospel when the storm comes our way. Practice what is godly by conforming to the word, not the world. Love each other even when we're offended with each other. To build a strong foundation is one of our most important things to do in our, in our Christian life. And when we practice these things, they will know us by our fruit. Amen? Amen.